National Geographic sent me to the remote Chinese village of New Jiao Shan, which translates to the head of a cow. Now they sent me to this village with basically zero training, zero information, and the night before we were supposed to film in this small village, thousands of miles from the capital, they said, Chris, you're going to this village. I want you to explore their way of life. And we're not telling you anything because we want you to walk into there with fresh eyes, without any preconceived notions. So I did. The bus dropped me off at the top of the main road and I looked down and there was a set of 500 stairs. There was only one way in and there was only one way out of the village. And the village, located hundreds of feet below, is in the base of this picturesque, beautiful valley in western Hunan. There's lush green mountains to the east and west, to the north and south. And there's a train that runs through the village from one mountain to the other every 30 minutes, even at 3.30 in the morning. And in this village, located in this valley, I realized that it was preserved in time. I was stepping into a time capsule. But as I stood at the top of the stairs, my guide began to explain to me, Chris, you know, the village is preserved in time for a reason. The topography keeps it safe. It's off of the main highway. The houses, they are built in a fashion known as diachalo. That means a hanging attic. So you have thin wooden slats in the walls that act as an air conditioner in the summer months, right? Because it gets very, very, very hot there. The houses are built close to each other so they can communicate through the walls. And the houses are built up on stilts because when the ancient Chinese settlers first came to this region, they wanted to be safe from the deadly scorpions and snakes and evil spirits. But right before I went down, they said, Chris, before you enter this village, we have to tell you something. A few years ago, this entire village was burnt to the ground. Almost every single home. I said, what do you mean? And my guide said, well, one summer morning at three o'clock in the morning, a fire erupted in one of the homes. Now, suddenly, all of those qualities that were blessings in the past, they now were all curses. Now the fact that there was one set of stairs in and one set of stairs out meant that everyone was trapped. Now the fact that the houses were built in that Diajalo fashion next to each other with the wooden slats acting as an air conditioner, now it acted as an incinerator, allowing the fire to jump from one house to the next in rapid succession. And by the time the villagers woke up that morning, everything they had ever known was gone. Have you ever had an experience like that? Maybe not your house specifically, but have you ever had the basis, the pivot foot on which you live your life, lifted up, turned upside down? Have you ever had to redefine yourself? Have you ever had to reimagine your world? I think we all have in this past year. We never could have imagined that we would have to wear masks. Never could have imagined that if I hug my mom, I'm, I'm putting her life at risk. We never would have imagined. But somehow we've come out the other side and I believe we are still here and we are stronger because of it. So National Geographic said to me, they said, Chris, we're sending you into this village with one mission only. We're not concerned with the devastation. We're not concerned with the fire. We're not concerned with looking back. Thankfully, nobody was killed in the fire. We're looking forward. We're reimagining. Chris, the per capita income in this village prior to the fire was 100 US dollars a year. 100 US dollars a year per person. Do you know what the per capita income is in the village now? Ma'am, what do you think it is right there in the front row? You're in the front row, you know you're gonna get called on. $200 a year, right there in the beautiful pastel red. Yes, that is you. How much? A thousand, what's your name? Debbie, we're gonna have fun, Debbie. Debbie gave the right answer. Debbie said $1,000. She's right. The per capita income before the fire was $100 US dollars per year. After the fire, it rose by more than 10 times to $1,100 US dollars per year. And they said, Chris, it's your mission to figure out how. Xie Shengfeng tells me each plant can be picked four times a year between April and November. Unlike me, the women here have such nimble fingers. 
I think Xiu Shengfeng has spotted I'm falling behind. Yes. How many hours are you here every day? Mm. Literally, this is this is all that I have to show for a few hours of work. That's a few hours of of solid work, and they'll pick if they work fast five of these baskets a day. There's no way my family would would survive. There's no way I would even survive out here. Now they're giving me the look. That means get back to work. Stepping down into this village, I was stepping back in time. And the first thing I saw was a young woman covered in silver. Everywhere from her head to her toes. I could see her face. I could see her eyes. That was it. Shi Sheng Feng, my mom, for the week. I asked her, I said, why is she wearing all this silver? She said, Chris, this is silver that her parents have been saving for for more than a decade. She's wearing 20 pounds of silver. It's a way to ward off evil spirits. It's a sign of respect. And before this bride gets married, she sits in her home as a ritual and she cries with her family for three hours. So does the groom. Now you might think, well, that's a little weird, but we have something like that too. It's called going away to college or Friday nights if you're me. No, I'm just kidding. Walked through the village and I saw the traditional way they made fire with ropes and sticks. I saw the silversmith that has been operating there for hundreds of years, making incredible artwork. And as I walked into her home and her neighbor's homes, I saw the most exquisite art tapestries on the wall. Where did this come from? She said, Chris, we did not have a written language in this village until 1953. So the only way we communicated knowledge and wisdom from one generation to the next was through our artwork. The tea that they grow, which you saw me picking, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. during the busy season, they make great money. It's some of the most sought after tea in the world. And we were sitting in the living room on one of my last nights there and we were drinking tea as we had done every night and we were eating food as we had done every night. They welcomed me into their home as you know, culture is local, it's not always national. And the culture of New Jiaoshan, of the Mao people, was very different than other parts of China. But they welcomed me from the inside out. And that is what I appreciate so much about what you do, is that you understand connection has to be on the local level, face to face. Being unfranchised, you know there's a person's name on the door that you can talk to if you have a problem. Is that right? People are held accountable. So we're sitting in the around the dinner table and all of a sudden 50 tourists walk into the living room, surround us. A guide walks in with a loudspeaker. I have no idea what's being said. They speak for 30 minutes. I think they're probably laughing with me or at me. I'm not sure. Then they leave. And I said, Shishung Feng, what just happened? She said, Chris, this is how we are supporting ourselves. This is how our economy is booming. This is how we multiplied our income by tenfold. I said, how? She said, we have tourists coming from all across China and all across the world to see how we live. I said, what? I said, what did you change? What did you change about yourselves? What did you change before the fire and after the fire? She said, do you know what we changed before the fire and after the fire, Chris? What? Nothing. We recognized the beauty within. We appreciated our own culture. And as a result, people from all around the world are coming to experience it firsthand. Me too. You've taught me about uh, resilience and and strength and patience. It's coming, it's coming through. Okay. 
Dum 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 dum. See you later. Liu Jiao Shan, China, was not the first place that I visited. The first place I ever visited when I left the United States was Tanzania. And I thought for a while, what story would be the most powerful to share with you? What's one that really touched my heart? And I have to say, it was the first day I ever left the United States to Tanzania at 20 years old. I went for a jog out of the community center where I was staying with my friends and my professor from Kenya. And we ran for about an hour. We passed the rugged cobblestone path outside of the United African Alliance Community Center. We ran in front of the field. We saw hundreds of miles of green pastures and Mount Kilimanjaro in the distance. And as we were making our way back to the community center, I bumped into a young man whose name was Abasai. Abasai was 20 years old at the time, just like me. And we began speaking, and being that I had my camera with me, I recorded the interview. He said, Chris, I've traveled hundreds of miles to be here to get an education. My family lives very, very far away. And as we were speaking, I noticed that Abasai's clothes were not that nice, according to my standards, whatever that meant. I noticed that his house was not up to the standards of what I thought was appropriate. He showed me the ghetto behind him where he lived which had running water from a communal spigot, electricity that came and went, no internet. And if I looked really closely, I could see that his teeth were almost beginning to decay because he'd been drinking dirty water most of his life, just like everyone in the village, and he just didn't know it. And so I asked Abasai a question. The question I asked him was, how can I help you? How can I help you? Ma'am, you have a light pink, shirt on. Yes, I am looking at you. What do you think he said when I said, how can I help you? How do you think he replied? Shout out your answer. First reaction. First thing comes to mind. What is that? Help people in other countries. Okay. Say it again. Okay. Uh, we're coming back right here. Yes. Yes, twice. What do you think? What do you think? Are you sisters? No. You could be. We'll come back to you. Jessica? How can I help you? Very, very, very close. One more. Sir, right here. You have a great head of hair. Glasses, right here. Yes. Clean water. Clean water. OK, great. One more. Ma'am? Jessica was the closest. What he said was one word, education. I would like an education. Isn't that why we're here at Leading RE? We want an education. We want to improve ourselves. We don't want to sit back. You could be at the casino right now, but you're not. You're here. We want to learn. We want to grow. We want to forge just like a diamond underground for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years so that we can come out stronger on the other side. He said, Chris, I see you're holding a video camera in your hands. I want to be a filmmaker, but I need somebody that's going to teach me how do I shoot, how do I produce? How do I edit? How do I write scripts? How do I bring them to broadcast and air them in homes in millions of homes for people to see around the world? What? We were in a village called Magia Chai, which translates to Mosquito Village, many, many miles from the nearest major hospital or university. How did he even know what these terms meant? So I pressed further. I said, why do you want to be a filmmaker? He said, well, I... I want to share something positive about my country, Chris. What do you see about Africa on TV? What do you see about Tanzania? What do you see about the entire developing world? What do we see? War, poverty, AIDS, genocide, drugs, people dying in the, in the streets of Kwashiorkor, core, extended stomachs of malnutrition. It's so one-sided. What Abasai was saying to me is he wanted to share a positive story about his country and his culture with the world. He was tired of being objectified. Has anyone in this room ever been objectified? Has anyone ever just judged you based on your title or your marital status or your orientation or your culture or your religion? Being objectified doesn't feel good because the person is no longer seeing us. They're seeing an image in their head. 
If we want to truly walk an inclusive and diverse path, we need to look beyond our image of one another and into our heart experience of one another, into a shared experience of our humanity. Abbasai came from hundreds of miles to go to school at the United African Alliance Community Center. He scored within the top five percentile in secondary school in order to get into high school. But he couldn't afford to go to high school because it cost $200 a year. He said, Chris, my father only makes $60 a year. So he said he can either send me to high school or my two younger brothers to secondary school. He said, I let my two brothers go to secondary school. I said, your father makes $60 a year. I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? I said, but that's not a lot of money. I'm not sorry, Chris. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that my father makes $60 a year. How's that for perspective? Some people are so poor in our village that they can't even buy cooking oil to cook their own food. At least with that $60, we can buy cooking oil, Chris. We can cook our own food. We can provide for ourselves. I am grateful. And what Abbasai was telling me was, start from enough. We are enough. We have what we need in order to be happy, productive citizens of the world, to become global citizens. Unfortunately, we're raised from a very, very early age, being told we're not enough. You're not good enough, you don't have enough, and you are certainly not enough as you are. You need X, Y, and Z in order to be happy. Now, I live in New York City where we have Times Square. What do you have in Times Square? 300-foot billboards filled with beautiful people to date, beautiful places to visit, food to eat, things to buy, clothes to wear. And what are each of those advertisements saying? What are they saying? They're all saying the same exact thing in a different way. Your happiness is out here. I think we should pool our money together at Leading RE and buy a huge sign to cover up that billboard in the middle of Times Square and have it read, you already have everything you need. That would be the truth, my friends. And Abbasai knew that. Abbasai was teaching me that wealth and poverty are states of mind, that we can have all the money in the world and still not feel like it's enough. But yet we can have nothing. And yes, perhaps it would be nice. Yes, we would love to have clean water. We would love to have a nicer home. We would love to have a stable place to live. All of those things are wonderful. That would be great. But we have what we need right now in order to be happy, in order to be present, in order to, to be empathic, to connect with one another and in order to commit our lives to a mission that is, that is greater than ourselves. So ultimately, he was teaching me wealth and poverty, Chris, they're states of mind. Even happiness and suffering, it's based on our experience. We should never, ever judge people based on the image. We should get to know the human underneath.